If you've been around the channel long enough, you'll remember when I had a look at the Corto Duo E7400 and 7500. If not, I'll link them down in the description below. Today though, I'm looking at another CPU from the Wolfdale 3M based E7000 series of Core 2 Duos, the 2.53GHz E7200. As it is effectively the same processor as the 7400 and 7500, just running at a different speed, you can go check out those videos if you want a detailed look at the specs of the E7200. We will be doing the usual today, and running the E7200 through some modern games and a couple less recent ones as well including some non-gaming benchmarks too, to give you an idea of what sort of performance this now 13 year old dual core CPU can offer if you happen to be using it today, or if, like me, you just happen to be interested in seeing how older hardware performs. First though, let's take a look at the rest of our benchmarking system for today, before moving on to the benchmarks. I'm using my usual Socket 775 benchmarking system for today which uses a Gigabyte GA EP45 DS3 L motherboard, 8 gigabytes of DDR2 RAM at 800 MHz, with timings of CL55515 2T, a MSI GTX 1080 Armor OC Edition graphics card to eliminate any bottlenecks, a Fantex TC 14PE cooler, and the 20H2 update of Windows 10 Pro 64-bit. The games will be run from a mechanical hard drive, with the OS and non-gaming benchmarks running from an SSD. First things first, let's get Shadow of the Tomb Raider out of the way. At 1080p with the lowest settings in DirectX 11 mode, the game launches but takes ages to do so, and running the game's inbuilt benchmark causes the system to lag so much that I can't reliably start to benchmark at the same time each run, so this one was a complete failure on the E7200, and that goes for both stock clocks and with an overclock as well. Crisis is up next, and at 1080p with the lowest settings in 64-bit DirectX 10 mode, the game at first appears to run relatively well. You can notice a small amount of micro stuttering and some minor hitches up until you are asked to use the binoculars for the first time, but after that the stuttering gets progress progressively worse as you progress through the mission. You also start to notice some pretty severe stop-start stuttering when you start to get near the Liskaz Call part of the map in the couple minutes leading up to that point. These stutters are represented in a graph of the frame times as spikes of around 127 to 148 milliseconds for a period of between 60 to 70 seconds. This is along with other spikes throughout that could be as high as 245 milliseconds at times, with more of around 35 to 90 milliseconds, and several more throughout below that mark. At stock, the E7200 managed 74.6, 29.4 and 10.5 FPS for its average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates respectively. If you want an explanation of what exactly 1% and 0.1% low frame rates are, I will link a video in the description by Gamers Nexus, who will give a decent run through of what these figures actually mean. The overclock, the max stable we managed being 3.71GHz with the RAM now at 936MHz, pushed these figures up quite substantially to 106, 47.9 and 20.9 FPS for average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates respectively. There is still some slight micro stutter at the start, which you have to really be looking for to see it. However, the stuttering continues to get progressively worse as you get past that first moment with the binoculars. Overall, the severity of the stuttering is massively reduced, and is quite noticeably better than it is at stock. However, you will definitely still notice it. Next, it's onto GTA 5, which performed a lot better than Shadow of the Tomb Raider did, but only in the sense that I could actually benchmark it. Performance at 1080p with the lowest settings in DirectX 11 mode was entirely unplayable. The game takes ages to load, and there were severe issues with texture popping on buildings, but the popping with the roads and issues with objects such as entire buildings popping in and out of existence were probably the most game breaking issues, as that kind of leaves you having to get around the map by memory in places, which sucks if you haven't benchmarked the exact same route around the map for nearly 3 years like I have. And this is on top of severe micro stuttering throughout the entire map. This gets a little better when travelling on the freeway heading out towards the desert area, however it's still reasonably noticeable. 
To give you a better idea of what the severity of the stuttering is like, the frame time graph shows spikes happening throughout the entire test of around 336 milliseconds, with several more throughout the map of up to around 511 milliseconds, and a few as high as nearly 900 milliseconds, which is almost an entire second. Stock clocks managed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 28.4, 4.3 and 2.3 FPS respectively. The overclock boosts the average frame rate by around 34%, but has little to no effect on the 1% and 0.1% low frame rates. The game, including cutscenes, loads far quicker now, however, and despite it being much less severe than at stock, is still noticeably micro stuttery throughout the entire test, and the texture and object popping is still just as bad as it was at stock clocks. CSGO is the penultimate test for the gaming benchmarks, and for this it was ran at 1080p with the lowest settings in a competitive bot match on the Mirage map, with texture streaming and boost player contrast enabled. Uber shaders were set to auto, which defaults to enabled anyway. While it may have been a much easier to run game in the past, it has got a lot more bloated a game than it was, meaning it's harder to run these days than it used to be. The E7200 had some pretty noticeable micro stutter throughout the entire test at stock clocks, which got noticeably worse when in close combat with the enemy, or when all of your teammates were around you on screen at the same time. This will cause combat to become more difficult at times, so you will probably want to avoid multiplayer matches. There are also some noticeable but thankfully brief hitches on occasion as well. There were several frame time spikes throughout the test of around 40 to 120 milliseconds with several more in the 135 to 170 millisecond range as well. There are also several more below that range, and a few above these ranges too. Stock clocks managed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 44.6, 20.4 and 10.1 FPS respectively, with the overclock boosting these figures up to 74.5, 37 and 20.5 FPS respectively. This is a fairly significant and quite noticeable increase in performance, however the frame times are still noticeably inconsistent, which you see represented as micro stuttering throughout the entire test. There are still spikes in frame times throughout at points of around 30 to 60 milliseconds, with more in the 95 to 120 milliseconds range as well. Lastly for the games is 2016's Doom. This was run at 1080p with the lowest settings in Vulcan mode only due to severe and unpredictable freezes lasting several seconds at a time happening when using OpenGL. This caused the benchmark figures run to run to be unreliable and therefore not comparable to each other in any way, so I stuck with testing Vulcan only. Performance of stock is quite noticeably micro stuttery throughout, which becomes more apparent when you move the camera around, especially in large and open areas. The stuttery appearance becomes noticeably worse when in the last part of the UEC mission, where you will also notice some minor input lag as well. Overall, it is still playable, but you are going to notice these issues. Dock clocks managed for its average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates, 47.5, 21.5 and 13.9 FPS respectively. There were several frame time spikes throughout the test of around 45 to 90 milliseconds with a few more around the 120 to 220 millisecond mark. The overclock had a noticeable improvement over stock clocks, with stutter being massively reduced despite still being noticeable at points throughout, including still being worse in the last part of the UEC mission. We're kicking off the non-gaming benchmarks with Cinebench R23, and as I said earlier, both the multi and single thread tests are being run. I run the benchmark three times, taking the score from each run and average out all the scores to account for any variances in score run to run. At stock clocks in the multi-threaded test, the E7200 managed to score 717.67 points, which puts it around 24.9% down on the i3-550 from the previous video, with its hyperthreading disabled. The E7200 has no hyper-threading capability, which is why the HD off scores are missing for it. Single thread wise, and comparing it to the i3-550 single thread performance, we're 24.55% down at 379 points, versus the 550's 502.33 points. This is with the 550's stock speed being nearly 700MHz faster than the E7200, so this difference would actually be far less if testing clock for clock, 
overclocking the E7200 up to 3.71 GHz pushes its score up by a massive 48.2% to 1064.33 points, beating the non-hyperthreaded stock clocked i3550 by 109 points or 11.41%. Although, as you'll see in a bit, the 7200 pulls more power. Single thread performance is now beating the stock i3550s by 10.55% at 555 points versus 502.33 for the 550. Blender tile-based rendering is up next, and for this, the Fishy Cat demo is being used. This is freely available for download online if you'd like to run it too. I run this the same way I run the Cinebench benchmark, in that I run it three times, taking a score in seconds to render a single frame of the animation and average out those three times to get the final score. And at stock clocks, the E7200 manages to render a single frame in an average of 329.59 seconds, a whole 70.24% slower than the stock clocked i3550 with hyperthreading disabled, showing just how much the older architecture of the E7200 struggles in this test, due to not supporting the newer instruction sets that the 550 does. To put that difference into a bit more perspective, the fishy cat scene runs for 100 frames, so that 135.99 second difference translates to just over a 3 and 3 quarter hour difference in time to render the whole animation. Single thread performance is over 100% slower than the 550 at 629.1 seconds to render a single frame, or a difference of 5 minutes 30.25 seconds. There are no overclocked figures for the multi-threaded benchmark for the E7200, as I had a problem running it where run to run, render time would differ by around 30 seconds each time, making that part of the benchmark completely unreliable. The single threaded benchmark with an overclock had no such issue though, and that managed a decrease in time to render over stock of 32.47%. This is still over 2 minutes slower to render a single frame than the stock clocked i3550 was. 7-Zip is up next, and for this I'm using 7-Zip's built-in benchmark. I run this benchmark in blocks of 3, with each block consisting of 4 runs of the benchmark. An average score in MIPS, or millions of instructions per second, is taken from each block and then averaged together with the others to get the final score. At stock in the multi-threaded test, the E7200 managed to score 4746 MIPS, 25.86% down on the i3550 with hyperthreading disabled. Single threaded performance sees this gap tighten to 16.85% at 2858.67 MIPS versus the 550's single thread score of 3438. The overclock though sees the 7200 overtaking the stock i3550 with hyperthreading disabled at 6676 MIPS an increase of 40.67% over stock clocks. Again, this is with the 7200 pulling more power than the 550 does at stock. Single threaded performance is now also better than the stock 550s, with a score of 3976 MIPS, or 15.65% faster. This is also 38.65% higher scoring than the 7200 managed at stock. Decompression is up next, and the 7200 closes the gap a little to the non-hyperthreaded i3550, with a score of 6,781 MIPS, 21.45% down on the 550 score. Again, this difference would be a lot less if comparing the two clock for clock. The single-threaded benchmark saw the E7200 drop a bit further behind the 550, with a score of 3470.33. 21.94% behind the stock 550, showing that the decompression side of the benchmark is taking more of an advantage with the newer architecture of the 550 over what it does with the compression side of things. And like it has with previous benchmarks, the overclock pushes the E7200 beyond what the 550 can manage at stock with hyperthreading disabled, 14.5% past it, or 45.77% over what the 7200 did at stock. This is also only 11.09% down on the stock 550 with hyperthreading left on. Overclocked single thread performance here is actually only 13.71% down on the overclocked 550. And this all goes to show that in some scenarios at least, the Core 2 duos come pretty close to matching or even beating the performance of the first gen Core i series dual core processors.
Finishing off with power draw, and the way I measure this is by using a physical clamp meter around the CPU power cable to get a power reading before any losses incurred by the VRMs are taken into account. I'm starting with power draw at full load, and this is measured while running the multi-thread Cinebench R23 benchmark. And at stock clocks, the E7200 pulls only 22.2 watts, plus or minus 3% down the CPU power cable. 14.91% more than the stock i3550 with its hyper-threading turned off. This shows just how much more efficient the newer architecture of the 550 is over the old Core 2 Duo, as the 550 scored 33.12% higher while pulling less power. Overclocking sees the 7200's power draw shoot up by 111.22% to 46.89 watts, plus or minus 3%. This is 12.77% over what the non hyper 550 pulled while overclocked, despite scoring 18.84% less. The E7200 only pulls 4.12 watts plus or minus 3% at idle, which sees a 94% increase to 8 watts while overclocked. These figures are also 39.14 and 32.94% less compared to what the 550 pulled at idle, while at stock and with an overclock respectively. So to finish up the video, it was actually quite interesting testing the E7200. Obviously it's not going to be great if even playable in any sort of modern games, at least the sort of more popular ones, I'm not sure how it will perform in say some of the less demanding indie games for example, but at least in the sort of more popular modern games today, it was never actually going to perform that well. Although to be perfectly fair, that was never actually the point of these videos. The point of these videos is more from a sort of scientific slash interest point of view. It's basically just to see what the processors actually do. And if they happen to perform well in modern games, then great, but if not, then also great, that's still, that's still a decent test result. Saying that though, it was quite interesting seeing the 7200 with a heavy overclock, mind you, sometimes outperforming the Core i3 550 at stock clocks in some scenarios. Obviously the 550 can be overclocked as well, but if you don't have a 550, you obviously can't overclock a processor you don't have. So even if you're not actually planning on using the 7200 to try play modern games, it's still going to be quite fun just to actually see what it can do. Because that's like the main reason I make these videos. Fun. It's often fun taking hardware from the past, trying to play games on it from today or run benchmarks on it from today, and just seeing how good or bad, as the case is here, they actually are. And occasionally you will get an older processor or an older graphics card that happens to perform far better than you actually thought it would. Like the i3-550 in the previous video for example, which happened to run 2016's Doom a lot better than I thought it actually would. And to finish up the video for today, I'd like to give shout outs to Patreon supporters Shadow in the Void and Peter for helping to make all of this possible. You can also support me through Patreon if you would like to at patreon.com forward slash benchy tests. Or if you don't want to become a patron, you could also support me through my Kofi page at kofi.com forward slash benchy tests. And Kofi has a hyphen between the KO and the FI. If you would like to become a patron though, from as little as $2 per month, you will gain early access to all of my videos for as long as you remain a patron. So thank you for watching my video, I really hope you actually enjoy watching this because I have a lot of fun testing these processors, recording the voiceovers, editing the video and whatnot. It's all fun to me and if what I find fun brings you people enjoyment then that's all the better. So yeah, thanks for watching the video and hopefully I'll see you next time.